So welcome everyone to our webinar. My name is Greg Philiban with Environmental Project Management Solutions. Uh, we are really glad you could join us today. In this webinar, we're going to be explaining how the EOS 2000 system effectively remediates and restores contaminated water. This presentation should take uh, approximately 45 minutes and then we will reserve 15 minutes at the end for questions and answers. Just so you know, to prevent disruption during the presentation, everyone has been put on mute. So if you have any suggestions, I suggest you jot them down, save them for the questions and answers session at the end, or post them in the question board in the webinar. We will then listen, I'm sorry, we will then unmute the phone lines for this part of the session. Uh, we'll try to get through as many questions as we can as time permits. If we run out of time, you'll be able to connect with us to learn more through email. Okay, so we're um, currently uh, just going to go through some introductions here onto how to use this system. And um, while we're doing that, hopefully there'll be a few more folks come on. I think we have about um, 11. Uh, registrants uh, logged in now um, with um, 24 signed up. So we'll, we'll give a few more minutes to go through this intro stuff and then uh, that'll allow the other folks to might be a little late to get on. So you should be looking at a uh, the, we the go to webinar window and you'll so before we get into this actual content you can, what you can do is you can easily minimize this by simply clicking the orange arrow to collapse the window. You can also drag it to a new location by click, clicking and holding its header so you can move it out of the way. And that way you'll be able to see the entire screen without any visual distractions for the control panel. Also, just so you know, there is a question board at the bottom of this control panel. And at the end of the session, when opening the floor to questions and answers. OK. I'd like to introduce uh, our presenter today, Asta. And Asta has been a project manager at WCI Environmental Solutions since 2005. Asta is a graduate from the University of Ottawa, and she holds a double major in chemical engineering and biotechnology, biochemistry. Asta is a technology expert and is responsible for project management, report management, and scientific research analysis with WCI on various water and wastewater remediation projects. She's well uh, versed and will be able to address most of your questions. Well, thank you very much. And Asta, I'll turn this presentation over to you. OK, thank you, Greg, for that uh, introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope everyone's having a great day. So my name is Asta Varshisht, and uh, I'm representing uh, WCI Environmental Solutions today, and I'm going to do most of the talking today. So as Greg mentioned, I've put everyone on mute for now, and there's a drop chat window on the bottom of the screen, and if you guys may have any questions, uh, save them either for the end or just type your name in that chat window, and I'll make notes. Um, but just so we have least uh, noise disturbance, you guys are on mute for now. So let's dive into our presentation for today. So what are we all going to cover today is what's listed on this slide. We're going to talk about um, healthy water bodies. Um, what are the quality parameters that affect the water uh, and distinguish it from healthy versus unhealthy. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of oxygen in healthy water bodies. Then we're going to get into the contaminated waters and what are the impacts of these 
various contaminants on, on water. Then we're going to introduce the EOS 2000 system as an alternative approach to solving the problems of water and wastewater. Uh, we'll talk briefly about how it works, and then we're going to dive into some of our typical applications that will help you understand and relate more to what problems can be solved using this technology. Then we'll talk about the implementation approaches and some of the financing opportunities. And then we'll wrap it up with a question and answer session because you guys may have a lot of questions by the end. So healthy water. What is healthy water or clean water? Well, and why is it important? It is the key to well-being of nature, aquatic life, and us as human beings. Lakes and waterways recycle and purify the water that we drink and consume in different ways. The waters absorb the waste that we produce. It provides us with food, fuel, shelter. It moderates our climate. It nurtures our body. And it feeds our spirits with their natural aesthetic beauty. So those are the reasons that make healthy living and healthy water a key part of healthy living. So what are the parameters that affect the quality of water? Well, water quality is described as the condition of the water, including its chemical, physical, and biological characteristics, usually with respect to its suitability for a particular purpose, such as drinking or swimming. The quality of uh, water is measured by a range of factors, and some of the most important ones are listed here. So concentration of oxygen. We're going to talk a lot about oxygen in our upcoming discussion. But for now, we all should make note that the amount of oxygen present in a given body of water is very important in understanding how healthy or unhealthy that water is. Secondly, we have bacterial population and kind. Well, briefly um, for now, we'll just say that bacteria are of two, diff two main kinds and how their population and kinds uh, are present in water really depicts the health of the water. Third is turbidity, how clean or clear the water is. Now this is more of an observational um, uh, parameter. If you look at a body of water and it's murky or unclear, well you know it's probably not very fit for drinking or swimming. Next is presence and quantity or quality of contaminants. Now, when we say contaminants, it's a very generalized term. There's all different kinds of contaminants that can enter into our waterways. Most of them can be distinguished as organic and chemical. So the quantity of them and the type of them really depicts the health of the water. Next is odors, foul odors. If you are by a water body and there is unpleasant odors coming out of this water, you can easily tell that that water is probably not fit for drinking. So again, it's an observational parameter. Next is algae. Now as many of you may already know, for those who don't, algae is the green coloration that's present in water. These are microscopic plants that start growing in water. They create water, uh, they create a green hue in water, and over time, if not treated, they form a thick green slimy mass that floats on the surface of the water. That is what's algae. So if your water has algae, or even if it has a green coloration, which is the beginning of algae, you know that water is unfit for human consumption or animal consumption. And last but not the least is excess vegetation. Now every healthy water body will have some amount of plants growing in and around it, and that's healthy. 
But when this vegetation grows out of bounds and the water is filled with all sorts of plants, well, then you know that you have a problem. So these are the parameters that are, are key in finding the nature, the quality of water, and we will cover them in uh, detail in the following slides. So oxygen. All creatures, including ourselves as human beings, need oxygen for survival. Now waterways gain oxygen from the atmospheric air above them when water flows simply by diffusion. It absorbs the oxygen from the air above it. Now what you'll see here is a picture of a fast flowing river on the left versus a lake on the right side which is uh, not as fast flowing as a river. It has minimal or little flow. And the reason that's there is for you to understand how a water body can enter into a situation where it will have less oxygen. As you may have seen, rivers are not very frequently um, get contaminated as opposed to lakes. Why is that so? Simply because rivers are very fast flowing and turbulent in their flow and while they're flowing they uh, riffle around rocks and there's a lot of turbulence that's created so a lot of surface area is exposed to the air above it and it kept, keeps getting oxygenated very easily and on a very regular basis. Whereas a more calm water body like a lake does not have this um, advantage. Only the top layers of the water are the ones that are in contact with the air and that are getting oxygenated on a regular basis. But as you go deeper into this water body, in the deeper layers of the water, there is no exposure to the atmospheric air and those layers are not getting oxygenated as fast or as efficiently as the top layers would. So that is the difference um, in different water bodies. And why is oxygen uh, so important that we're talking about it, that it reaches all the layers of water, we'll discuss soon. So what are contaminated waters? Now this is just a picture to show you that all sorts of pollution sources that surround our waterways dispense their contaminants in the water. Um, may be residential sewage, may be storm water, may be wastewater from the industry or a mining site. Everything lands up in our water. Now what happens to it when it enters our water? Well, the water body, just like a human body, has its natural defense mechanism to fight these contaminants. And the key player of this natural immune system of the water is oxygen. The amount of oxygen that's dissolved in the water fights all these contaminants of various natures that enter the water and keep the water clean and balanced. It does that via a lot of uh, pathways. We're not going to go into much detail for the purposes of this webinar, but a takeaway is that oxygen is the the key cleansing agent in natural water bodies. So what are the impacts of these contaminants uh, that enter the water? Well, after having understood that oxygen is the key player in the natural immune system of water, as these contaminants increase in volume in the water, the dissolved oxygen in the water is outweighed by the demand to fix these various contaminants. You keep dumping more contaminants, eventually the oxygen is going to run out. And that's when you enter a state of anoxia. Anoxia, hence, is simply defined as a state of low or depleted oxygen in water. What happens as a result of this is aerobes decrease. Now what are aerobes? Aerobes are microbes, microorganisms or bacteria that survive in the presence of oxygen. And they are the working forces of the water. 
they are the microorganisms that efficiently digest the organic contaminants or organic sludge that's present in the water. But they can only act in the presence of oxygen. Therefore, for cleaning of organic sludge, oxygen is very important along with the presence of microorganisms in order to support microorganisms. As oxygen depletes, anaerobes increase. What are anaerobes? Now, anaerobes are the bacteria that survive in oxygen deficient conditions and they are not as efficient as aerobes. They are slow and sluggish in digesting organic sludge and not only that, they're pathogenic. That means they can cause diseases. That water with anaerobes is not fit for consumption. Also, they produce foul odors, a class of anaerobes called the SRBs, when digested on organic sludge, produce the foul odors. Then there's products like hydrogen sulfide, nitrates, ammonia, methane, and other greenhouse gases start eventually increases in this water of low oxygen. Now, these are all bad gases. Hydrogen sulfide is a gas that's characteristic to, uh, of a rotten egg odor. So when you're around the water that you get this foul, uh, rotting egg odor, you know that there's a presence of hydrogen sulfide in that water. This is also created in swamp or sewer waters because it has a lot of organic loading. So oxygen gets depleted very, very fast, and anaerobes start producing this gas. Uh, methane, as we all know, along with other greenhouse gases, uh, is also bad for consumption breathing. It's a poisonous gas. And these kind of gases also start increasing when there's not enough oxygen in the water. So is ammonia. Ammonia is a toxin. A water with ammonia is not fit for drinking or swimming. It's mostly present in animal and human waste or nitrogen-containing fertilizers, and even industrial discharges. So there's a lot of sources of ammonia that can end up in the water. Next is the phosphorus. Now, when phosphorus increases in water, it can really create some big trouble. Phosphorus is a nutrient that is usually found or is sufficient uh, in very, very low concentrations in healthy water but it can become increasingly fast because there's a lot of sources of it around the water. There's decomposition of organic matter, there's weathering of rocks, um, human activities in uh, human waste, soils, a lot in fertilizers, um, and, um, and also the sewage is very rich of um, phosphorus. So eventually when this phosphorus increases in the water, the water can add a state of what's called eutrophication. Now let's define eutrophication. It's a vicious circle that the water can get entrapped in, starting with excess of a contaminant, particularly phosphorus. As phosphorus increases, it, it feeds algae. We've already mentioned algae before. It's the green, slimy material that's uh, of plants that are found floating on water. Now, phosphor feeds these algae. As phosphorus increases, algae increases. Over time, these algae will die off and the rotting organic sludge in the water will increase. Also, this algae blocks off the air-water interface and the natural mechanism by which water gets oxygen from the air by simply diffusing or absorbing from the air is now blocked off. So furthermore, the source of oxygen has been cut off. Now, as algae dies, organic bottom sludge increases, you need more aerobes to digest this. But aerobes need oxygen to survive, and since we've blocked off the entry of oxygen in the water, they can digest this organic sludge. So you have all these problems and low oxygen. Eventually, fish have no oxygen to survive on, and they die as well. So you see how there's a vicious circle that's, uh, that's formed just by everything increasing in low oxygen, and the water system eventually suffocates. 
and this can become a very serious problem. So here's just a picture of what really compromised or eutrophied water looks like. Your water will look particularly green with a slime floating on top and you'll uh, commonly see dead fish. So summarizing, stressed with organic and inorganic pollutants that we mentioned, oxygen is very important in the water to maintain the nutrient cycling. If the volume of these contaminants keep on increasing, this nutrient cycling is going to be disrupted. Eventually, low oxygen is created that can further lead to all the downhill problems like algae blooms, unpleasant odors, excessive sludge buildup, poor fish, and overall poor aquatic system. So now that we've understood or just revised what the problems of the water are, let's introduce an alternative solution. The EOS 2000 system for water and wastewater restoration and remediation. Now, this system removes the dependence on chemicals or mechanical aeration. It's 100% natural and it uses the dynamic nature of natural aerobic processes. It involves no chemicals, it's solar powered, it's very easily transportable, it's low maintenance and it's a sustainable solution. So what are the benefits of the EOS 2000 system? Well, the main benefit is that it increases the oxygen in the water. And after having understood how important water is in maintaining the natural immune system of the water, once we have provided enough oxygen to water, then the natural defense mechanism can fight all the contaminants. So it stimulates the aerobic microbial activity. These microbes start digesting organic bottom sludge, so the sludge starts to reduce. It improves the discharge quality of the water. It reduces the unpleasant odors by removing the anaerobes. It reduces the or removes the dependence on mechanical aeration. It keeps these nutrients, particularly excess metals or excess phosphorus, locked up into the bottom sediment so they can't be fed on by algae and hence it reduces algae and excess macrophyte growth. Overall, it restores a healthy aquatic system along with decreasing turbidity in the water. So the water starts to become more clear. And the basic fundamental of its working is that it simply boosts or strengthens the natural immune system of the water by increasing oxygen. That is the takeaway from, from this. So here's a picture of what the EOS system looks like. There's three main components. On the top, you see a power supply, which is a solar panel. This is the only power supply, as this equipment needs no other cables or external power supply. Run completely on solar energy. On the bottom to it, you see the control box, uh, which has the circuitry, which we're not going to go into details. It's beyond the scope. And the box is then connected via a cable to the antenna. The antenna is what you see lying on the ground and is the part that actually floats in the water. The remaining two parts sit offshore. And this antenna is the one that emits out energy waves in the water that actually increase the oxygen. You would ask how? So how does the EOS system work? Well, the EOS system, the antenna that we just saw, generates resonant energy waves at specifically prescribed frequency pattern. This energy field that's created, it improves the overall quality and health of the uh, water ecosystem by increasing the oxygen throughout the water body. 
top to bottom. Now why I say throughout is because if you remember I had mentioned that the top layers is not the problem, it's the bottom layers that become compromised very easily. What the EOS does is very equally it uh, provides oxygen to all the layers of the water so that a healthy ecosystem is overall maintained, even the layers that are not in contact of the atmospheric air. And this, in turn, increases all the natural cleansing processes via the biological, chemical, and biological pathways. Again, these individual pathways is a little beyond the scope of our first webinar, and we will talk in more detail because that's a little bit more technical. But the takeaway from this is that the EOS 2000 system increases the oxygen in the water. Oxygen forms the key part of the natural immune system of the water, which in turn cleans the water via all the mechanisms that we went through in the previous slides. Here, um, let's quickly go through a list of uh, the Ministry of Environment certifications that the EOS 2000 system has. So there is a Certificate of Technology Assessment, Certificate of Approval for Waste Management System, and Certificate of Approval for Municipal and Private Sewage Works. So now that we have understood what the problem is, which is the excess contaminants, what is the need to fix, that is to strengthen the natural immune system, i.e. oxygen, and what is the solution, which is the EOS, that provides this oxygen. Let's dive in to some case studies to digest all the information that you just grasped and uh, put sort of a reference frame to the kinds of problems that we have solved in the past. So. First, this is the aerial picture of the Sudbury Tailings Lagoon to the right of the slide. And um, this is an older picture. Uh, when we started this project in 2007, the lagoon was only 125 acres. Over time, it increased to 500, and today it stands at over 1,000 acres. And a single EOS 2000 unit is um, controlling the entire lagoon. In the right-hand corner, you see a black deposit in the lagoon, and that's actually where the entire city of Sudbury dumps their city sewage into the pond, see, into the lagoon. So you can imagine the amount of contaminants this lagoon must be getting. It's not only getting the industrial tailings, but also the entire city's sewage sludge. So in 2007, when we went into this lagoon, their main problems were excess odors, again, due to the amount of organic loadings as well as the industrial loading. So after two years of operation, there were no odors that were observed. And in fact, there are no odors observed till today, since the unit has been working nonstop since 2007 till today. And the overall lagoon, now DO, uh, before I start saying DO, let's um, uh, quickly um, understand the terminology. DO simply stands for dissolved oxygen. Why dissolved? Because we're talking in terms of water. So just because the probe measures um, it as the dissolved oxygen in the units milligrams per liter, you'll often hear me saying the DO and the units. So it's just the amount of oxygen that's found dissolved in that water. And it's one of the key parameters that will help us understanding the quality of water. And to get a rough idea of the numbers, from 0 to 3 milligrams per liter is considered very low oxygen versus anything above a 3 starts to get healthy and oxygen rich. So the DO in this lagoon went from 1, which is quote-unquote very low oxygen, to 9 milligrams per liter, which is very high, at the bottom. Also, you'll often hear me saying at the bottom, because as I mentioned before, the top layers 
are not very depictive of the entire health of the water body since they're always in contact with the air above it. So we always take measurements at the bottom which are typically the most or likely to get most compromised the soonest. So here's the picture of the Alexandria Mill Pond. Uh, it's situated in eastern Ontario. Here's a picture of the unit that sits in an island in the middle of the pond. And uh, an important factor about this pond to keep in mind is that this pond serves as a source of the drinking water for the entire city. Now their objectives were to reduce the excess vegetation in the pond the algae and the odors. So it was pretty compromised and uh, they had all the problems that you can think of. Since 2005, after the first year of operation, they had no algae blooms. Algae, just a reminder, is the green water coloration and the slime that covers the water. The over <coughs> excuse me. The overall quality of the water was improved. The DO levels were maintained at a high range of between 7 and 9 milligrams per liter. Again, that is a high oxygen environment. The bottom sludge, the organic sediment, was reduced from 18 inches in height, which is a lot, to 6 inches in height. This was after the first year. So you can tell 18 inches is a lot of um, undecomposed um, organic matter. Given the oxygen, the aerobes can start chewing it away. And there was a 75 percent reduction in the excess vegetation in the entire pond. Next uh, is the Soskowik Lake uh, uh, in the Lesna Pond in Sosnowik in Poland. Um, it's about eight acres in area and about one and a half to two meters deep. Uh, their objectives were to increase the oxygen in the water, removal of the sludge, and clarify the water because the water was very turbid. So after the first five weeks of application, the DO, dissolved oxygen, increased to greater than seven milligrams per liter. Again, that's a very high oxygen level. The bottom sludge was reduced by 10 to 15 centimeters, and the residue was brown granular material. Now, when you see the bottom sludge is slimy and dark black, um, it's, it's sticky, that's when you know it's undigested and unhealthy. Over time, by the aerobial microbial activity on digesting it, it transforms into a fluffy, lightweight, more brown, granular material, and that is an indication that the, uh, the environment is aerobic and healthy, and there is organic digestion taking place. So that was converted from a black bottom sludge to a brown soil-like material. As well as the turbidity was reduced and the water had clarified to the pond, to the point that the bottom of the pond, up to two meters down, became visible. Next is the Morocco Pond in Katowice in Poland. This is another pond that was about 21 acres, and it was beside an industrial coal mining site. So it was, again, getting a lot of chemical loadings in it, because of which the oxygen was low, the bottom was dark black, uh, sticky, slimy uh, sludge. Uh, there was um, algae blooms, as well as there were coliform bacteria. Now quickly, just let's tell you a little bit about coliform bacteria. These are a kind of anaerobes. If you remember in our earlier slides, we had described anaerobes as being the bacteria that survive in low oxygen conditions. And I had also mentioned that these are pathogenic, that is disease-causing. Now, coliform is a type of anaerobes 
that are very harmful and are disease causing. A very common type, which most of you have probably heard about, is E. coli. It's found in human feces and other uh, plant, uh, animal waste. So having to consume it, drinking the water that has E. coli or swimming in water that has E. coli can be very, very dangerous. So this pond had that. So after the first two months of application, the oxygen increased to 9 milligrams per liter at the bottom. The algae were reduced. In this picture, you cannot see any surface algae. As well as the coliform bacteria were virtually gone. And after having to told you about how harmful these coliform bacteria can be, the beaches by this pond were shut down by the government. But after two months of this application, since they were gone, the government decided to open the pond for recreational purposes for the first time in 10 years. And this made it very controversial and the Polish news channel actually decided to make a documentary on the big news. Now I don't have the link here, but for those who are interested, the link is available on our website. Next is a golf course pond uh, in British Columbia, Canada. And to the right, you can see the progress pictures. In the first picture, you see the pond is virtually covered in the green slime, which is algae. Now, most common problem that a golf course pond will get into is algae. And the reason for that is that the turf around the pond, to keep it uh, aesthetically looking beautiful, a lot of fertilizers is around the pond and these fertilizers are very very rich in phosphorus. So where does all this phosphorus leach into? Well it leaches into these ponds and as mentioned before phosphorus is the feed of algae. So more the phosphorus the more the chances of algae formation. So algal blooms are very commonly observed in golf course ponds. So as you see here Within about over a month of application, the algae had started to reduce and eventually disappear after the first month. So all that happened here was that the EOS provided oxygen to the water. This oxygen caused the phosphorus to not be available to the algae, but instead be contained in the bottom sediment of the pond and hence control the algae problem. Next is the Pasco Pond in Washington, D.C. Uh, again, a similar problem as you see in the pictures, massive algae floating on the surface of the water. The pond was about 10 surface acres uh, and about 9 feet deep. And in 30 days, so exactly in a month, the algae was controlled simply by providing oxygen to the water. The other benefits in this case were that the DO had gone up from 7 parts per million or, or, or 3 parts per million or milligrams per liter up to 17 parts per million, which is a high jump. Also, this water had odor problems. This was also remediated in the first month. The dying algae that goes to the bottom increases the bottom sludge and that was digested by the aerobial, uh, microbial activity and the water became crystal clear. So the last example that we're going to go over today is the Stonebridge stormwater pond. So I've, just, I've tried to discuss different kinds of water bodies so to give an idea of the range that uh, the, the problems of the water can be targeted by the EOS. Now what's a stormwater pond? It's just a pond that gets all sorts of contaminants by um, residential and, and roadway runoff that ends into the pond. So a lot of chemical contamination. Now this pond again had um, a history of algae problems in the summer when the weather is warm, the plants like to grow, and a lot of phosphorus comes in by the runoff of fertilizers, automobile waste, and just the runoff of the turf around them. So within about two months of application, the water had become completely clean and 
clear of the surface algae, as well as the dissolved oxygen went up from less than three parts per million, swinging up to swinging between seven to 18 parts per million, and no algae was observed on that season after the first two months, after the EOS was um, implied there. So let's talk about um, briefly about our implementation approach after we know what the capabilities of the EOS are. Now technology is only a part of the solution. We believe in a wholesome approach that is together we can make a difference and the technology only comes to play its role once the damage has been done beyond a certain point but to avoid that in the future there's other things that we can take care of other activities as listed here so activity A is needs assessment and objective setting now every water body is unique it's unique in its composition in its contaminants that it's getting, uh, its bacterial population, its uh, inherent immune strength, etc. So before we target a particular water body, it becomes very important to customize it and really understand what it is all about. And then we can understand the scope of how to attend the problem of it. Second is the activity B, which is the capacity building. This involves training, monitoring, and reporting. Now, correct methodologies and their significance is very important to understand by the personnel who are in direct working of a certain water body. Understanding its ecological dynamics, uh, developing custom-suited protocols for monitoring and collecting the data, timely reporting, and everything becomes important in order to monitor the progress and distinguishing it from the starting point. And last but not the least is activity C. Now engaging the community. After all it's the community whose actions are uh, displayed in a water body. So education and cooperation the first hand uh, users and potential manipulators of the concerned water body is also very important and this can be done via different awareness programs or educational um, sort of rallies and protocols. So overall, we think all these things can make for a wholesome approach in solving a problem. Now, after having talked about this, um, let's briefly go over some of the financing options that we have to offer. Now, here you'll see um, there's four types of EOS listed. Now, um, not to get intimidated, these are just uh, four different types based on different sizes of the unit. Um, depending on the size of the water body, they're meant to target. So for example, type A would be used of smallest unit for a water body that's less than 10 acres. So small ponds, marinas, stormwater ponds, and so on. Type B for water bodies up to 50 acres, as well as that have a little more of contaminant loading. So uh, sewage lagoons or industrial lagoons or tailings lagoons would be in this category. Type C counts for larger water bodies like lakes um, or harsh industrial contaminated lagoons. And type D, we won't go into much detail for this particular webinar, but it's more for a custom suited specific contaminant application. So here we've just listed some of the prices based on a lease, monthly leasing option. And uh, also there's available a purchasing option for all the four types depending on the water body. And these are obviously subject to discussion. Now some of the funding opportunities and the main objective of, um, of this webinar is to make um, those of you who are not aware already is that funds are made available by the government to the First Nations and this is called the FNWWAP, the First Nations Water and Wastewater Action Plan. This is to support the First Nations communities 
to improve their drinking water and wastewater services. And some of the key activities that this action plan includes is uh, investing in infrastructure, um, operation and maintenance, uh, which is very little with the EOS, um, training, monitoring, and spreading awareness. Therefore, if you recognize the use for any of your water or wastewater problems that you're encountering, then this is how you should pursue with the opportunity and this can form a part of the next year's uh, annual infrastructure investment program and um, uh, more discussions can be um, done for a follow-up for those that are interested. So I'll pass this on to Greg now just to wrap it up. I'll have to unmute Greg for that. There we go. Okay, thank you very much, Asta, for your presentation. Uh, that was very enlightening. Um, we've covered a lot of information in this webinar today, and I'd like to just quickly recap some of the items that Asta covered. So uh, we talked about how healthy bodies of water contribute to our quality of life. We looked at what affects the quality of our water, the role that oxygen plays in keep cleaning water, the impacts of contaminated water and low oxygen. She looked and explained how the EOS system is and how it works. Uh, she walked us through many uh, case studies around the world. We briefly discovered the we, sorry we briefly covered the implementation approach that uh, WCI takes to implementing the EOS 2000 system. And finally, we address the financial opportunities as well as funding opportunities available, um, namely around leasing or purchasing. It's off to you, Greg. OK, so this is a highlight of the product. Um, it's a sustainable and effective solution. It's affordable. It's solar powered. It's sustainable. It's eco-friendly. It's a non-chemical approach. It's portable, so it can be moved around. It's easy to install, handle, and manage. Another point there is that it does come complete with um, uh, mentoring and guiding and coaching on how to use the system and maintain the system. So as a follow-up to this webinar, uh, we're going to have another webinar uh, on October 30th. And we're going to talk in more detail about the role of oxygen and microbes in targeting specific contaminants. I know there were some questions specifically around specific contaminants, so that would be a good one to attend. Um, talking more in more depth about good water parameters and uh, techniques for monitoring water quality. So these would be upcoming as part of our educational series on October 30th. So this pretty much concludes our webinar on the EOS 2000 system. We hope you found it of value and of interest. Uh, if you want to learn more about this solution, please we invite you to contact us uh, either by email or by giving us a call. There's the email address as well as the, um, the telephone number. So uh, thank you for your, your time and attention today and enjoy the rest of your day. That concludes our Thank webinar. you, everyone. We hope to connect soon. The recording and the presentation again will be sent to everyone via email who registered.